He paid a debt I did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. But now I can sing a brand new song. Amazing grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never. He paid the debt he did not owe. I owed the debt, but I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. Now I can sing a brand new song, amazing grace. Lord Jesus, pay the debt that I. Lord Jesus, pay the debt that I could never. this song this week after, after my morning devotion and I was reading actually it was two weeks ago I was about to preach on the line and um, in the morning the Lord gave us me a song during the devotion and it's simple but it's a declaration for everybody in this place and the song goes like this as for me and my house we will serve as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's why we choose you. We have experienced your power and your glory. That's why I choose you. Because I have experienced your power and your glory. That's why I made up my mind. Because I have experienced your power and your glory. For as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's why we choose you. Huh. We have experienced your
sometimes there comes, through, comes a time in your life where people ask you, why do you believe what you believe? Sometimes you may not have the theology right, but you have the experience. You have, maybe the doctrine is still funny, but yet you've seen his glory. That once I was a sinner and you knew how I used to live, but now sick by grace. I like the man of God that came on Monday told Cap Crew that your life, it is Christians that read the Bible, it is unbelievers that read you. It is Christians who go deep into the word, but when it comes to unbelievers, the epistle that they're reading is your life. So, Sometimes they may ask, why do you dance the way you dance? Why do you scream the way you scream? Because we have experienced something we've never seen or felt before. It's a glory. Sometimes I pity those who lack testimony. Because it's when everything else breaks around you. When you have an experience, it keeps you solid. It keeps you solid. Somebody was trying to, he, I remember one time somebody was giving me, giving, me, giving a debate about something and I was like, you got a point, but can you explain this? Something that happened to me, I was like, bro, I shared the story with him, the story about the Range Rover. He's like, bro, I can't explain it. Even the most wisest person must fall to the glory of God. And the most powerful person must submit to the power of God. And today it's my prayer that as we come before the Lord. May you leave with a testimony yourself. That may you leave with a power that you never felt before. And may it be so evident that you will not have to say anything, but may people be able to look at you and then testify to God's goodness. That's the best testimony. That's the best kind of testimony where you don't have to say a word, but people can put together the fact that God is good from your life. Let's open our Bibles to Romans chapter 12, verse 1 to 2. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. And by the grace of God, we've been talking about the past few weeks on how to unleash the gift that God has placed inside of us. How to unleash God's gift that he put inside of us. And we heard some powerful messages, great things that God used our elders to, 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 to speak to us. But as we were praying and as we were thinking as leaders, we're saying, what is the next direction? Where does God want to take this church to? And we've learned about our gifts, but we also want to learn that having a gift but bad character is a waste. You see, the Bible says in Genesis that the story of Adam and Eve, and the Bible talks about how they had children, and these two kids now bring an offering. The Bible says that, and Abel brought an offering, but the offering that Abel gave, the Bible says, and God was pleased with Abel and then his offering, which means that to God, it's not about what you carry in your hand, it's about what you carry in your heart. It's, it's not always about what's in your hand. It's about what's in your heart. So we said that if we're going to unleash people with their gifting, let's make sure that we unleash people who are holy unto the Lord. Because it doesn't make any sense to go out and the same people you want to bless do not want to be blessed by you. Just like I said, unbelievers read your life. If they read it and they don't like what you offer, whatever you say is a waste. So if we're going to unleash ourselves, let us be unleashed in holiness. Let us be, oh, can I get an amen? amen. Oh, come on, put a smile on your face. Don't look at me like that just because we're talking about holiness. I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about holiness. Come on. Somebody look at me like this. That if we're going to be unleashed, may our unleashing give an aroma of holiness and righteousness. You know, when you pass by somebody, they smell you. If they can't see you anymore, they can smell you. It's my prayer that when you pass by unbelievers, may it not just be your cologne and perfume they smell. 
But let the aroma of Christ be so much on your life. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15, he says that there's an aroma of Christ, right, that comes from our lives. That when people smell it, it is like a sweet fragrance unto them who are being saved and, unto, and to them who are also dying. So our life is an aroma. You're so, you're so worried about, look, I like cologne too. Look, I wasn't a big cologne fan until I got married. My wife would show me all these things. I'm like, wow, this, is, this smells good. This smells good. It's good. Use your money to buy it. Put some deodorant on. Come on, smell good. <laughs> buy what you need. But yet, after you're buying all the cologne and perfume, make sure that your life gives the scent of righteousness. Yeah. It, 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 it is, cologne is good. But what is cologne? When a person smells you, but then smells your personality and can tell you're somebody I don't want to get to know. So cologne becomes a waste when the personality and soul is joked with. So let me tell you something. Cologne may pass away, but a good name shall live on forever. <laughs> let me tell you something. You can be laughing, but it's the truth. What is in style now will not be in style the next 50 years. But a man who prioritizes his character and name in his life, even when he dies, his name lives forever. The Bible even says that Abel, we still speak of him. Why? Because of the offering that he gave. We still speak of Jesus. Why? Because of the offering of his life that he gave. And his blood speaketh better things than that of Abel. Better things. Somebody say better things. I pray that may your life give off better things. May your life give off righteousness. Uh, look to your neighbor and say, neighbor, your body counts. Look to somebody else and say, my, hey, look at that. Hey, slow down, slow down. Look to your neighbor. I didn't say ask them their body count. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I said your body counts. Oh, man of God, have I, have I said anything wrong? Have I said anything wrong? Look to your neighbor and say, has elder said anything wrong? Look to your neighbor and say, neighbor, your body counts. Look to somebody else and say, neighbor. Your body is important to God. Now that one sounds better. I think you like that one. Clap for Jesus. Clap for Jesus. Clap for Jesus. Amen. I wasn't going to leave you with just the body count. I was going to add your body is important to God. Amen. Amen. Romans chapter 12 verse 1. And we're going to stick to this one verse. We're going to stick to this one verse. And we want to break it down. We want to just see what God is saying in this one verse. It says, I appeal to you therefore. Brothers, and I also ask sisters, because I don't want anybody to exempt my elder, but you said brothers. No, it's sisters are they. They're inside. They're inside. It's inside. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers but, and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present, somebody say present, your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Give me King James. And let me tell you why I like King James. So I want you to understand. This one has nothing to do with the sound of the words, but I really want to drive home a point. If you can get King James or New King James, that's fine. Thank you. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Reasonable service is when a person brings their body to the altar of God. Reasonable service. Now I want to play a, a film quickly, and I want you to, I want you to see some. Not just a clip. It's a quick clip I saw on the internet. Can we start again? Thank you. 
Amen. I pray that maybe we all have a testimony that our jobs are giving us unlimited PTO. Amen. <laughs> when I saw this thing, I was like, my God. Unlimited PTO. I need it in my life. I need that in my life. Amen. Now, if you didn't understand what was going on, there's a man, he, stand, he said he talked to his leadership in his company. And they're saying that, look, why don't we try unlimited PTO for all our workers? And they're like, bro, how's that going to work? Less control means people are going to do a lot of things that maybe like, they won't actually do the work. He's like, no, let's try it. They said they tried it for a few weeks, and they realized there was nothing negative and nothing positive that happened. So they said, okay, let's just see in the next three months what's going to happen. The next three months, they realized that re uh, revenue goes up. Productivity goes up. But yet, people use the same amount of PTO they were using when they had the restrictions on it. And then that's when the Holy Spirit ministered. I just saw, I was, we were at the couple's dinner, and I was just on my phone. And I saw this. I said, this would be a great introduction to what Paul is telling us in Romans chapter 10, verse 1. What Paul is saying is exactly what this person came up with. He said that when you as a company show the workers that you care about their lives and their work balance life, when you do that, their reasonable response to what you did for them is that they'll actually do more work because you actually care for them. The funny thing about this story is that people didn't even use the PTO wildly. They said that the PTO remained the same. It's the same concept when it comes to the law of grace. People think that, oh, because we're in grace and we tell people that we're living in grace, people are just going to live anyhow. But Paul said that I beseech thee, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. He's saying that. I'm beseeching you on the platform of God's mercy. Meaning that from, he said, therefore, meaning that when you see therefore, you have to ask yourself, why is therefore, therefore? Why, why is he saying, and why is he starting off this chapter with therefore? Because Paul was showing us, or showing the church in Rome, that from chapter 1 to 11, this is what Christ did for you. This is what God did. This is how Christ bore your sin, and he's now giving you a new life. Now, therefore, your response should be, I put my body on the altar of God. So, he's not saying that in this dispensation, you should live anyhow. He's saying, live off of the response of what Jesus Christ did for you. So, I tell people, if you suffer with habitual sin, it's probably because you don't understand what Christ did for you. The response of the workers were, shoot, they care about me, so I'm going to do the job. Paul is saying, God cared about you so much. John 3, 16, I never get familiar with that scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So whoever believes in him shall not perish and have everlasting life. God loved us so much that he sacrificed his own son. Now in response to what God did, you must lay your life on the altar. It's, it shouldn't be difficult. All you need to do is think. This is what he did for me. This is what I'll do for you. It's, 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 it's simple. Now he's saying, the body. He said, lay your body on the altar of God. Somebody may be sitting here looking at me like, Elder Yao, I hear that. But please, oh, how about my heart? My, my, my heart is in the right place. Uh, God knows my heart. Why? Why must it be? My body, ladies and gentlemen, if your heart is in the right place, then it means your body will also be in the right place. The Bible also says this. It says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, which means if the mouth is a part of the body, it must give a response from the heart. So if you're making a mistake, 
You can't say he just knows you. He knows and he knows me. Yes, he knows you, and that's why he's telling you, get in alignment with what I'm saying in my oh, I won't get a clap. I won't get a clap. It's because it's and Graham, I think today will just be me and you. Because where we are going, we are going. We are moving. Look. I'm preaching this from experience. The reason why Christianity was difficult is because I did not understand holiness. I knew holiness from what my auntie told me, not from what the Bible told me. I knew holiness from the standpoint of what Sunday school, Sunday school teaching wrapped in culture taught me. So when I'm saying it this way, it's not because, oh, I'm trying to be so. No, no, I, I want you to get that living for God is right when your mind is renewed with an understanding that Christ died for me, so I lay my body on the altar. God knows my heart. Yes, but he wants your body. My heart is in the right place. That's good. But he wants your body. I, think, yeah, I sacrifice every day. My time, I come to choir rehearsal, I do crew, I do this, I'm always sweeping, I, I fix the chairs, I do that. That's good, Boo Boo, but we need your heart. Not your heart, we need your body. Yeah, um, elder, I get my money. When we did a hundred thousand dollar thing, I gave five thousand. I gave ten. If you think my commitment to the church is not real because I, after all of this, I, no, yes, it's good. That's fine. But lady, it's not just and 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 my and sons and daughters. Let me just say, it's not about what you bring with your hand. Trust me, God is more concerned with the body. How do I know this? The Bible says that Jesus said that before you bring the offering into the house of the Lord, make sure the problem that you have with somebody, you fix it. So some churches will be okay with what you do because you pay tight. Some people will be okay because you sow seed. But as for me and my house, we, oh, Tally, I think this message is Look. You must, come, you must come to a place whereby <laughs> you realize that it's good that we're doing all the activities, but we must ask ourselves, have we laid our bodies on the altar? Somebody maybe say, oh, elder, but, but why the body? Some quick reasons why the body. Number one, once you are saved, your body no longer belongs to you, but to God. It is fact, it is simple, it's scriptural. Your body, I know in our day, in our culture, when it comes to body, when it comes to choice, when it comes to ideas, when it comes to what I want to do, we all feel entitled. The spirit of hum humanism is, uh, is huge, it is big, it is everywhere. But we are not called to that spirit. We are called to the spirit of Jesus Christ. So why our bodies? Why? Because it's not ours. 1 Corinthians 6.19 or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. So right there, and yeah, why my body? Because it's not yours, it's his. The day you became a Christian, you, you stopped just being a human that puts on name brand. You became a human that took on a new form that became the temple of the Holy Spirit. So that if nobody has been to church for 10 years, the day they meet you should be their first church service in 10 years. Amen. You have become the temple. Look, everybody says, this is not, the building is not the, the church. It's true. You're the church. If you understand this and you know this, then we must have our bodies on the altar. It's not ours. God, the owner of the church, has come and purchased us. He's made us. Look, yes, a church is made out of bricks and stones. But now when God brought you from darkness into light, he's now made you a living stone. So you become a person everybody sees. That I've not experienced Jesus in years, but when I met Van Dyke, I experienced Jesus. Man of God, God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Yo, that's the kind of energy we need for such a message. You know, you know, Elder, 
the Bible is amazing. Let me tell you why. When you're preparing a message, or not forget preparing a message, when you read the Bible, there's no way you can truly remain the same. And let me tell you why. The Bible is like a mirror. It exposes you to yourself, but then exposes Jesus to you. So when you read, you can never read from a place of, I got it all together. Any believer that says, I got it all together has it all wrong. Every day, low believer arrives. Every day you read your word, it brings you closer to the image and the likeness of Jesus. So, you've got to come to a place whereby your energy for such messages should be so exciting because it's not leaving you at a place where it allows your fleshly desires to be elevated. But when you, you hear messages like this, including myself, as I'm preparing it, I'm seeing how of a wretched soul I am. And knowing that makes Jesus more better. Why would I have a savior if I feel like the savior has no essence in my life? He's saving me each and every day. Trust me, the preacher preaching to you, he's saving me each and every day. He's helping me. And I pray that as you hear this message, you understand that number one, your body is not yours, but Jesus wants to do something with your body. And it is to glorify the Father. But number two, the other reason why our bodies is because we will all be held accountable for our actions within our bodies. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That each one may receive the things done in the body. According to what he has done, whether good or bad. I was reading this and I said, Jesus Christ, when my movie plays, I, I don't know what I'll do. It is grace. It is grace. Like, when you read these things, it exposes you like, Jesus, so the day I get to see you on the judgment seat, that day you'll be playing back the things that I'm not so happy with. But what is this? That's a playback Sunday, isn't it? But what it does is it encourages me to live right. The day my movie plays, may it be like one of my favorite movies. That it starts off bad, but at the end, it gets better. So, you must make it a point that your body will not be used for rubbish. It will be placed on the altar of God. So that when you stand before him, your head will not be down, but your head will be up. Said, once I was a sinner, but yet now I've been saved by grace. Your body, you, you'll be held accountable for what we do in our bodies. Not only that, but the whole person must be saved. A lot of people think that Ariel, my spirit is saved as salvation. My soul is being saved, sanctification. So let me say, my spirit has been saved at salvation, which means justification. But then my soul is being saved, which is the sanctification process. But now, let's look at our bodies. Our bodies will be glorified when Jesus comes back. So we're in a body that has not yet been redeemed. So that is why we go through the things we go through in the body. Because the body is groaning, awaiting for the arrival of Jesus Christ. It's awaiting. So it's like, that's why Paul could tell the church in Philippi, I wish I could be with him, but for your sake, I'm here. It is a man that is groaning in his body. And he's like, man, I wish I could be there because my body is itching. It's aching. It wants to get to heaven. And I pray, may that also be your desire. That, look, you may be waiting to get married, but may you wait and say, and anticipatingly, anticipatingly and, and I don't know, my English is gone. But let me just say, that may you wait as much as you're excited for a wedding. May you also be excited for the second coming. Because our bodies, our bodies are yearning. Our bodies are going through things. Let me give you scripture for that. It's, it's Romans 8. Romans 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, verses 10. I'll read 11, and then I'll go to 23. It says, and if Christ is in you, 
the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. Verse 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to where? Your mortal so Christ has entered you, sin has died, but yet still sin has died and the law of sin has been canceled. And when you die, you know, it's like slavery. Say, you're, it's like slavery. Let me, let me, get, let me get there. <laughs> I'm just trying to, it's, it's Black History Month, so I want to land well. I want to land well. I want to land well. But it's like slavery. Let me put it like this. You, you're, there's this, okay, uh, Graham, come now, the Graham is the slave owner. I am the slave. Now, when you were in the world, Ephesians chapter 2, if you could put it up. Ephesians 2 teaches us that when we were in the world, we were under the power of the prince of the air. So, when we were, we were dead in our sin, meaning that if we were dead in our sin, we had no life in us to see and to do righteousness. Because we're dead in our sin. So, because you're dead in your sin... You are being operated and moved by sin. So if he's my, let's say, my slave owner, and he's the power of sin and the penalty of sin, and he's whipping me, and he's whipping me, and he's whipping me. And then Abraham Lincoln comes out of nowhere. Give me Abraham Lincoln. Like, like you come. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln says, say, hey. <laughs> Now Abraham Lincoln says, today I free the slaves, right? What, what it means is that another person has come to free me from the power of slavery unto sin. And now I'm on his side. Now, oh, don't go, don't go. You are still the slave owner. Don't go. But when, listen, but when you die to something, they used to say about slaves that the only freedom a slave has is death. He will go to heaven and have his rest. That's what they used to say. Because when you die, you're done. But in this case, scripturally, when we die to sin, we also come alive in Christ. So we are dead to sin. Now the issue now becomes, now that we die to sin, another spirit has come to make us alive. Now that we're alive, it's up to you to choose who you would obey. Because you're no longer under the power, but your mind still remembers this. That's right. It's like the Israelites in Egypt. God took them out, but yet they were still asking for the food in Egypt. Freedom has come, but yet you're still thinking about your slavery days. That is what sin does to us. Jesus has come. He's broken sin, but yet we still think about those days were fun. And because those days were fun, you say, I can't get over this thing. I, I just can't stop sleeping. I just can't. You, you, the power has come to break you away. The thing is that now, all you're doing is you're giving power back. So the scripture says, don't let sin. <laughs> so the point I'm trying to make is this. The Bible says that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, Jesus died for our sins. Three days, done. But thank be unto God that the Holy Spirit woke him from the dead and made him alive. Now, this same body that Jesus had and was pierced is the same body he has in heaven. Tell me, the body, if I go deep into the body, you'd be like, Jesus, this body thing is not a joke. You wouldn't play with your body. Sit down, Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> but, so, the point I'm trying to make is this. Verse 23, I want to read it. It says, R Romans 8, 23. Not only that, but we also have the first fruit of the Spirit. That even ourselves grown within ourselves. Eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. So I was telling you that salvation, the process of salvation is complete when our bodies so because we're still in this body, we're still going to have some issues until Jesus comes. 
the good news of God, his spirit that is in us, helps us come against the plan of the enemy when it comes to sin over our body. Now, number four, the body is the instrument in which our soul acts. Your personality expresses itself through the body. So you can say, man, my spirit is good, you know, so what? But your body is important because your body is not really who you are. It's your soul who you really are. But your soul can only express itself in, its, in your body. So when you're mad, it's either you're going to say something with your body or you're going to punch somebody with your body. It's ha- your emotions are not just something that is just a, it's, it's expressed through your body. So your body is important because your body really tells us where you are in your walk. So you may say, well, my spirit is good. Yes, but we must see you bear fruit. And if you're going to bear fruit, we can only see that through the body. Because your soul expresses itself in the body. Number five, the last one of why our bodies are important to God is because the body is one of the main places for sin. Romans 6, verse 12 to 13. It says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Listen, it's telling you, do not let. Meaning that you have a responsibility to make sure that sin does not reign in your mortal body. Therefore, make sure, let let sin not reign in your mortal body. That you should obey in its lust. Again, Paul is speaking to Christians. He's not speaking to unbelievers. He's speaking to Christians. And he's telling them, you've been saved. But some of you are going back to your slave master, obeying the desires of your body. But there's a power inside of you that gives you the strength to be able to say no to all forms of ungodliness. So he's saying this. He's saying that, and do not present your members. Okay, we see the word present again. We said, Romans 12, 1, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now we're seeing here that do not present your members of your body, your hand, your eyes, your feet. Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. What Paul is basically saying is, it is the body that carries, when we say like the, 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 the place where sin truly lurks is the body. And because sin is lurking, you have to be very careful not to allow sin to take advantage of you. And it's going to take advantage of you through your body. Look, when uh, was it? Cain was about to kill Abel. God rolls up on him and is like, yo, bro, sin is crouching at your door. Master it so that it doesn't overtake you. Cain didn't listen to the advice of God and went and killed his brother. This is what Paul is saying. You've got to present your members of your body towards righteousness. Because if you're not pointing towards righteousness, it will automatically make sure you go into unrighteousness. You've got to master it. There's a power inside of you. It says, come alive. I mean, the Bible wouldn't tell you to do something that you cannot do. It's telling you to come alive. Look, the excuses are many, but the power in us is so great, but we're not exploiting it. We're not exploiting it. The Bible will not tell us to do something we cannot do. Hmm. Jesus is Lord. If you choose not to present your bodies each and every day on the altar of God, you're indirectly or directly presenting your body on the altar of the enemy. So if righteous living, we'll get to that. But if you choose not to put your body on the altar, the devil will show you and will choose for you what to do with your body. The body is important. Now, you may be asking me in your head, Elder, 
The spirit of God is in me, but why do I struggle to kill the desires of the flesh? I feel like I come to church, I pray, oh, you know, I, I love God, I come, but for some reason, I just can't seem to shake off this struggle. I've come to bring a good news to you. Listen, it might sound wild in the beginning. That's like my title was, but let me land. <laughs> if there is a struggle, then praise God. Let me say that again. If there is a struggle, praise God. But if there's an addiction, break it. Listen, a struggle only makes us aware that we have been saved. Because look, when you were dead in your sin, you had no notification that what you were doing was a bad thing against God. No, you may know morally that this is not right, but you would think you're actually being immoral to self. But when your eyes are open to salvation, you begin to realize that it's not about me, but it's about how I must honor God. So when you come to a place where there's a struggle, you say, thank God. Because it means that a struggle doesn't mean you've given in to the enemy. It means you're at a place whereby you can say, for God I live and I don't want to go here. And sometimes you may be in the middle and you're like, man, how do I do better? How do I? It's cool. But now there's a power inside of you that you don't have to be subdued by the enemy. But a struggle should indicate unto you that God is doing a work. Bro, have you ever got to a time in your life where you sin and you could care less? Yeah, y'all can act fake in here. So yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. Did I mean? Man, I, I was... Uh, Tell it, we can do something. The next day, we are leading praise and worship. It's fine. Yeah. I'd rather struggle with the fact that, God, I don't want to do this than to say, go to hell with that. I'm doing this. Then you will actually go to hell for that day. When there's a struggle, guys, don't think that you've been defeated. A struggle is an indication that you're walking with the Lord and you're being sanctified. The problem comes when you give in to the desire. That's when we must begin to enforce some spiritual things and lay your body on the altar. So if there is a struggle, praise God. But if there's an addiction, what do we do? Break it. I said if there's an addiction, what do we do? We break it. Now Romans 8 verse 12 to 13 says this. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. So the flesh, the fruit of the flesh is death. But if by the spirit, listen, and this is what gets us. If by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Listen, I'm going to repeat it again. And hear me cl close. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now, elder, why is it that I'm struggling? And why is it that I now fall into the very thing I was struggling with? Now I'm in it. And now I'm in a cycle. Now I'm addicted. The reason why is because you're using the flesh to fight the flesh. The scripture says, and if by the spirit you kill the flesh. Let me tell you something. If you're horny, a run will not help you. It will help you for a moment. Oh, let me keep it real. Hold on, Ada, Ada. Look at, look at Valerie's face. She's looking at me like, oh, Ada, why are you? Mm. Let me tell you something. Tell me. Ada. We have been running and running, but yet these things are still a problem. Because running will help you for a moment, but it won't actually help you with the issue at hand. <laughs> listen, this is a serious, listen, this is a serious thing, guys, that we're, we're just controlling our issues, but not dealing with it. So the reason why you are going back to the same thing is because you keep thinking, 
that I'm going to try this by myself. Your wishful thinking does not help you overcome sin. How many of us have been wishing we got better? We've always wished. The issue is that we're using the flesh to fight the flesh. If it was the flesh that could help the flesh, then Jesus would not be needed. But we needed God himself that came as a man as well. God, the, what we say, the God-man. He was perfect. He went on the cross. His blood was shed. But in him, that spirit, that when we believe Jesus, when that spirit comes into us, it doesn't leave us just to be here for us to look good mm. and say we have the Holy Ghost and we speak tongues. Mm. No, it, it, it's in us so that it helps us fight the works of the flesh. Because sin dwells still in the flesh and it's awaiting the glorification when Jesus comes back. So we, until Jesus comes back, he's left us the Holy Spirit to help us attack the issues that have been attacking us. Mm. Bro, a cold water is not going to help. <laughs> Look, the issue with belief is we are always thinking presently. We are not thinking destiny. We're not thinking ahead. It's like, let me just do it for now. But, tell it, I learned something. What a man sows, he reaps. It may not catch you today, but one day it will. If you massage your issue, the massaging at one time will not help. Have you noticed when you have an issue in your flesh, go and see a chiropractor. The chiropractor is not going to help forever. Then they may say, go and get a surgery done. You can tell that when there's a chronic issue, there are levels to it. And just like in the flesh or in the physical realm, there are levels to treating things. In the realm of the spirit, it's the same. That everything, if there's an issue in my body, I don't use Kumbaya, Lord, to take it away. I say, God, help me spiritually. Like, Lord, I need your help. You must confess that this is my issue. Holy Ghost, help me. Now, Jesus already knows what your issue is. You're just too proud to confess it. <laughs> so when you, you allow pride to cover it with him, and the thing is that you leave God because you don't come to him with that. Oh, Lord, I love you. I okay, here's my little issue. Yeah, God, but there's an issue. Yeah, don't worry, I'll take a run. The run, the run will not help. <laughs> Look, therapists also need therapists. So you, your, 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 your physical idea of what can help your sin issue will not help. People say they want peace on earth. But what's going on in Gaza and all these things, peace on earth doesn't come by the UN. Even if there's a ceasefire and hear me well, it will not stop. Because people are wicked inherently. The only way peace comes is if we accept Christ. Now, if everybody accepts Christ and lives out his ways, there will be really peace on earth. Because why would I attack you if Christ would tell me not to do so? So if everybody, so the issue with, this is why evangelism is very important. Because I may be Holy Ghost filled and living right. But if my neighbor is not, we're still going to have an issue. So there's war because Christ has been left out of the equation. He, that's why he's the prince of peace. Guys, you can't use physical things to help physical things. You need a higher power. Somebody say a higher power. I said, somebody say a higher power. Today I went to my therapist. That's good. But there's a higher power. Now I'm telling you this, me, I, have, I also go to therapists. Because there's things they understand. But yet, there's only something the Holy, there's some things that only the Holy Spirit can do. So if your issue is something that is spiritual, trust me, don't think something physical is going to help. You must go to the Holy Ghost. Somebody say, I'll go to the Holy Ghost. One more time, say, I'll go to the Holy Ghost. So Romans 7, 5 to 6. It's a lot of scripture, but I want to read it so you understand where I'm going. Romans 7, verse 5 to 6. I read this yesterday and I said, no, no, I need to hit this. It says, for while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, 
so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. What that basically means is that if you are a New Testament believer, don't go by the Old Testament covenant. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me say it again. Or let me say something else. You really get what I'm saying. The Ten Commandments helped, but the Ten Commandments, they didn't solve the problem. So the reason why you're stuck in an addiction or we are stuck in cycles is because we're applying Old Testament principle in the dispensation of grace. Let me explain. The speed limit is a law, right? They put the speed limit up, you're driving. Now, we think the speed limit is good, yes or no? Is it good? Yes. It's very good. No, it's, I mean, I know you may want to speed, but it's, but it's good. It helps prevent crashes. Fine. Now, though the speed limit is good, it also is a bit funny. And why is it funny? It's because though you see the speed limit to be good, it also tells you that you are bad. Because without it, it means that you don't need to be controlled. But because there is a speed limit, it's now indicating to you that you need to be controlled. Because if we leave man to themselves, everybody will do what suits or fits them. So we have to now put a law to, to notify you that, bro, because you're bad and I know you will speed, go 45 miles per hour. So it's just a law that makes you aware to your sinful nature. But it only makes you aware, but doesn't give you the power to overcome the issue that you have. So the law is good, but yet it doesn't solve the issue. And that's why we are stuck in cycles. Why? Because you wake up every day and you're like, God, today I will not masturbate. I will not fornicate. How you doing, y'all? I will not fornicate. I'm doing good. I'm like, how you doing? I'm doing good. I will not fornicate. The issue you have is this. You're focused on the law, but not your relationship of laying your body on the altar. So, look, the scripture even says that our sinful nature is aroused by the law. Let me tell you why. Listen. Hey, listen. Let me tell you something, bro. When somebody tells me not to do something, Inwardly, it makes me want to say, I'm going to do it. <laughs> this is Bible. I'm not preaching you something that's not. This is Bible. It says that the law arouses us to disobey. It's like my son, Ezekiel. I don't know who taught him how to, how to not do what I tell him to do. <laughs> it's inherent in him. Like, bro, why are you going? No, that I'm going. I don't care. <laughs> but that's all of us. We, we think we know more than the law. So why do I need to go 75? I don't think I need to go. But if everybody had somewhere to go, we would all get into car crashes and die. No, li no li listen, it's like if there's nobody to patrol us, if man is not saved, they'll be living unto themselves. This is why putting your body on the altar is important. Because it makes, it puts you out of the picture and makes God first. But what is God's law to man? Love the Lord God with all your heart, all your body, all your soul. And love thy neighbor as your. So if we adopt the message and the spirit of Christ, we'll be looking out for one another. And really wouldn't even need law because I'm looking out for you. You're looking out for me. But because this world is not like that, people are selfish. They're not putting their bodies on the altar. They're living their own life. You tell them what to do. They say, leave me alone. You tell them, well, what, what do you know? You're trying to help you. But yet, they say, I want to live on my own. And because of that. So the cycles you see is because you're so focused on the sin issue. Without being focused on the relationship with God. Where the relationship with God, when you focus on your relationship with God, it solves the sin. I will not masturbate. I will not masturbate. I will not fornicate. Oh, I will not fornicate. Oh, I will not commit adultery. I will not do this. I will not do that. I will not do that. And then you are still gossiping. But look, you're only focused on the things that you feel are an issue. So you're missing out on God's entire plan for man. That he shall live out the fruits of the spirit. 
Because they're just focused on the law. Thou shall not kill. Thou shall not steal. I haven't stole. I haven't stole. Anyway, me? I haven't, I'm good. You know when I, when I was addicted to masturbation, bro? Hey, that, those days. I used to write on my calendar, day number 22, free of no masturbation. And my focus was always, I didn't masturbate. I didn't, I didn't watch porn. I didn't masturbate. But my soul was still dying because I was given power to, 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 to law and not grace. Where grace gives you opportunity to be like, hey, instead of thinking about your sin, think about just laying your whole body. And when you lay your whole body in love me, masturbation will be taken care of as well. So the reason why we're stuck is because we're too focused on the thing we don't need to be focused on. We should be focused on the relationship with Jesus. And when you're focused on him, he takes care of everything else that you struggled with. Got a gram. Think about it, right? Say, you, say you're married and then Jennifer gets up and you're just up there. And all she hears you say every day, I will not cheat. I will not beat my wife. I will not beat my wife. Listen, I will not beat my wife. I will not beat her. Get up. Hey, baby, how you doing? I'm good. I will not beat you. I will not beat you. I will not beat you. <laughs> and then every day, let's watch a movie. While you're watching the movie, I will not beat you. I promise. And then she does something annoying and you're like, I will not beat you. I will not beat you. Your wife would be like, ah, are you okay? <laughs> Did I marry the right person? Like, should we, why? Because... He's so focused on not offending her, but he's not focused on loving her. He's not, he's just, so, so when you're so focused on not sinning, just, oh, I don't want to sin. I don't want to do it. You give power to it. But you need power from God. Like, Lord, I lay my whole life. So Jennifer will say, babe, just love me and trust me. As you love me, your hand will never smack me. The reason why you're stuck is because you're stuck on trying to just be perfect than the finished work of Jesus Christ. Guys, until I learned this, bro, every day I'm counting the clock. Man, I didn't, I didn't do this. And I'm, when I do that, I'm giving power to it. What if I'm praying every day? Ah, I'm reading my Bible every day. I'm falling in love with God. There's nothing in me that will make me want to do. I will not obey the fleshly desires because I'm so uh, focused and amazed. I'm gazed upon Jesus and his beauty that I don't want to leave his presence. Because if I leave his presence, I know something out there is not good for me. But when I'm gazing at his beauty, there's nothing else I want to do. Look to your neighbor and say, neighbor, gaze upon his beauty. Come on, say, gaze upon his beauty. Come on, go to somebody. Come on, get up on your seat and tell somebody. Say, gaze upon his beauty. Gaze upon his beauty. Come on, say, gaze upon his beauty. Gaze, gaze. Jesus. Take your seats. Look. Look, some of y'all can act bougie, but this is what we are struggling with. Bro, challenge. Oh, Jesus. We've been there, done that. But because the body is still being grown, we're still in some things. But we can tell you, Jesus keeps us. And we're so gazed that what was an evil habit has become something that we look at like, no, I can't do this again. Your struggle is okay. It just means that you're really trying to walk with the Lord. And as you keep gazing upon him, trust me be able to overcome that very thing that you see as a habit. Amen. So back to Romans 12, 1. Present your bodies. Somebody say present your bodies. Present your bodies. In the Old Testament sacrifice, there would be an animal that they would present. Paul is giving us a picture of what happened in the Old Testament. That when we talk about sacrifice, it's with animals. But in the New Testament, it's not animals. Ladies and gentlemen, it is you. He's saying that present your body willingly. Isaac is an example of that. Isaac was a young man. His dad put him on the altar. He was strong enough to tell Abraham, son, get off me. I'm not going to die today. 
but he did not say that. He willingly placed himself on the altar. I'm talking about that kind of willingness. Jesus presented his body and placed it on the altar for you and I. Now Paul is asking us to be like our Savior. Put your body on the altar. Present your body as a living Meaning that, how can something be sacrificed and live at the same time? You are living but dying at the same time. What are you dying to? You are dying to your sinful desires. But you are, li you are living in the power of his resurrection. You are living in the power of his spirit. So every day you present yourself on the altar. You are dying to sin. But you are living in power. When you present yourself on the altar, you are dying to your habit. And you are moving in power. When you present yourself on the altar of God, you are dying to your addiction. But you are living in power. So if you find yourself addicted, you must ask yourself, where is my body laid? Where is my body laid? Answer that question in your head. Oh God, today I present my... Holly, it's about time that we, that we care about our body and our Christian walk. I don't want to be a church that is known for what we don't do. I want us to be known for what, what we actually do. One thing the enemy will do, especially for Christians like me, you're up there in your eyes. You're up there. What will happen is we will say, at least I'm not doing this. At least I'm not doing that. Oh, it's not about what you're not doing. We're asking, what are you doing? Because when you're focused on what other people are doing, then you're actually noticing that you're not actually keeping your own body on the altar. You've just become a body watcher. Just watching everybody. Is this person doing? No, what are you doing? We must, be, we must be a church that is known for what we are doing. And I pray that may all of us come to a place where we present our bodies on the altar. But he says a living sacrifice. We're dying to sin and we're living in the spirit. It says holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable act of worship. Holy meaning that when they would get the animal in the Old Testament, it would be without blemish. It would be without any issue or theft. And then they'll present it. They'll set it apart. As holiness means being set apart. You must ask yourself, that I'm, I'm, have I set myself apart from everybody else? It's not about, yo, this is the Christian life in America. No. What does the Bible say? Have you set yourself apart? Have you become an acceptable offering? Because of time, I'm going to speed this up quickly. I want to leave you some practical things. Don't watch what everybody is doing. Look at the Bible. Because America can make you feel like you're doing the most. <laughs> so, yo, go, go, to, go to China and see somebody do Christianity, then you realize what we are doing here is a joke. <laughs> Come to church one time. Nah, I'm not too much. I want to do what I want to do. Some people can't even find buildings to have church. And if they're found, they're killed. But with your freedom, you joke with it and say, I come anyhow. Present your bodies on the altar of God. <laughs> Let me give you some quick things. Have a plan for your body. Write this down. Have a plan for your body. We have plan in America. We have plans for weightlifting. You want to build muscle. We have a plan for dieting. We want to lose weight. But what is your spiritual plan for your body? Number one, watch where your feet go. Galatians chapter five verse sixteen. Walk in the spirit, so that you do not gratify the desires of the. Walk. Somebody say walk. walk. Walk in the spirit so that you do not gratify the desires of the flesh. So where your feet tread upon is important to your righteousness. It's where you go to maintain, to make sure. I, I got to have a plan. I choose not to go here because here triggers my flesh. 
what, whatever triggers your flesh, watch it. Don't go there. Look, Psalm chapter 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man that does not, what? Walk in the, what? Counsel of the ungodly. So I need to figure out who am I walking with. Not just walk in the spirit, but plan, have a plan for your body that your friends don't trigger your flesh. Bro, if we're, <laughs> Charlie, try fasting with a couple of guys who don't like to fast. You will never fast. <laughs> hey, bro, I'm hungry, bro. What you doing? Like, bro, we should go to McDonald's, bro. We should go to York. Let's go to TGI Friday. Bro, let's go to Ruby Tuesdays, bro. Hey, bro, I'm fasting. What? What? You fasting? Bro, stop playing. Just get some food. And because your, your stomach is calling you, yeah, you're right, bro. I think I can go. I think God knows my heart. <laughs> God knows my heart. I did 9 to 12. I, I did pray. I, I did pray a little bit, you know. I said the Lord's prayer. It was good. It was good, bro. Yeah, so let's go. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> if, 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 you, if, you, if you don't plan, you don't have a plan for your body. Where you will walk will trouble you. Bro, the quickest way for men to be changed is change his surrounding. That's why when women have an issue with their, their, with, their, with their mans, they go to the boy, yo, talk to your mans. I've been talking to him, he doesn't listen. Because they know that the guy, from a guy perspective, will be able to speak sense to him. But what happens when your circle doesn't speak spiritual sense? Somebody say mercy. mercy. What happens if your crew don't speak sense? When it's not sense, it becomes nonsense. <laughs> so somebody say, have a plan for your body. Well, what you listen to, your ears. Place the members of your body on the altar. Your, it means your ear. Because whoever has your ear has your emotions. Whoever has your ear has your understanding. They inform you. They create. Look, when I was looking at the biography of, of, of Malcolm X, is when he was in jail, some Muslim brothers were able to get to him and inform his outlook on life. And after that, he became one of the most radical Muslims. Think about if a believer was able to speak into his mind and the gift of life entered him, Malcolm X would have been a great evangelist for God. So, wherever your ear inclines to, his power will be your destiny. Because Samson listened to Delilah, he gave up his secret. Your ear, have a plan for it. Make sure that if I'm going to listen to it, it must be spiritual and worth it. Sometimes, it's not just spiritual, it just needs to be right there. If you're not coming to tell me anything, why am I listening to you? Maybe I'll just hear it, but I won't listen. Have a plan for your ear. Have a plan for your eyes. Choose what you want to see so that it informs and helps you on this walk of life. Bro, that was my biggest problem. And if I'll be honest, I know it's a problem, but grace helps us. Grace, you see, the reason why I have to go to the, the, to the, to the altar every day is because I know my weakness. Don't be a fool and think that. The Bible says, for he who thinks he is strong, ah, may he take care lest he falls. That's the Bible. So every day you can't say, I've arrived, so I'm not praying today. You are fooling yourself. Find your place of prayer and pray. Because you're going to need it. Your eyes. If it is pornography, please let us find blockers. And block your laptop. Give somebody your, like, Charlie, this is church, but let's be practical. Because, Charlie, the flesh, I gave you the spiritual, the flesh will come and lurk. The question is, will you obey is the, is the man's, or will you walk with the spirit that's in you? And you only walk with the spirit that's in you when you're practical with your walk. Don't just come here, hallelujah, here, you, thank you, you're, and you go. No, what are you going to do on Monday? What are you going to do on Tuesday? If you need a blocker, put the blocker there. And if you need, and another thing is that, Get accountability to your righteousness. That God, I know you see all things, but I need a brother that can also help me. Right. I need a sister that can also help me. I need a friend. Look, we are a young church. They're actually waiting for us to be like, when is this going to just wild out? We must show them. 
Sir, we have sense and Holy Ghost. So have a plan for your... If you don't have a plan for your body, you have a plan for your body to fall. Because it's groaning, waiting for Jesus to come. As he's doing all of that, Charlie, we have a plan, a system. Somebody said, I must have a plan, and I must have a system. The last thing I'll say is, renew your mind. Have a plan for your mind. Watch what you read. Do you know when I speak to females, when, if they have an issue, right, they always tell me about these Zane books that they read when they were young. Everybody in this book, I'm like, hey, this book is demonical. Am I, is it Zane or is it some, hey, that's my generation, maybe. Ah, no, is it Zane or Zen? No, it's like these sexual books. It's like you read it and it's, those, it's like a, it's a story, but it's very explicit. What is it called? Zane, thank you. See, some of you are acting like you didn't read it. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> like, like, yeah, yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm, I didn't read it. You read it. When your mom come to the room, and say, I'm just reading the Bible. No, it's saying. <laughs> but the Bible says, place your body on the altar of God. But it also says, renew your mind. So have a plan for your mind. Say, Lord, I'm going to read thy word. David said, thy word I have hid in my heart so that I may not sin. So it is the word that helps us. Ladies and gentlemen, enough with the excuses. The power is in us. You have the choice to go back to your slave master or follow Jesus. You are addicted because you're too focused on sin. And you've not focused on righteous living with God. If you want to overcome in 2024, fall in love with Jesus. Don't just come to church, fall in love. You can only fall in love based upon knowledge. If you aren't reading about him, you will never fall in love. You'll be going based upon what everybody else is saying about your God. So this year, I pray for you, that may this be your best year ever. Amen. That the things that hindered you and kept you, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. That may that chain be broken. And may you be a Holy Ghost filled, spirit filled, righteous and holiness living person. The, from the elders all the way to the members. This is for all of us. And I pray that may the Holy Ghost indeed put its power. That when that struggle comes, we will walk with the spirit. Father, we thank you. We bless you. We give you the glory. Wherever you are, confess what you need to confess. Take it off. I'm never going to need you. You can play yourself or you can make yourself by having the Holy Spirit help you. Whatever you've been struggling with, do you know that there's a Holy Ghost destiny for you? Where some of you are supposed to be pastors, evangelists, prophets, prophetess. All these, oh, the, 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 the sky is the limit, but the cap has been the addiction. Today, denounce it. Today, denounce it. In life, you're only playing yourself because God knows what you're doing. But sooner or later, you're just playing yourself. So keep it real with the Holy Ghost now and say, Today, I'm I sin, feel bad, and then go over it again. No, Holy Spirit, help me. Holy Spirit, help me. Help me. Help me. The more I'm praying.
Franklin said something I will never forget. He said that he had a dream and he was in heaven. And God said, this is what you did with your body. This is the good and this is the bad. But I'm here to tell you, Devin, that this is the plan I had for you. But because of this addiction, you only went this far. Yes, your spirit is saved. You will go to heaven. But wouldn't it make you feel crazy if you knew you could have did more and now you don't have the opportunity to return to do it? When I heard that testimony, that was all I needed. Maybe everybody's clapping for C3. But there's probably something greater that is ahead. But because I'm content here and ministry is moving, I don't have to call any of you guys to come. You are here. I can say, I don't need to pray no more. They won't see what I'm doing. And I'm content here. But maybe God wants to trust me with more. And because I can't, I choose to obey the desires of my heart. I put a cap on my destiny. Fam, don't put a cap on There's so much more. You know, you feel bad. You do it and then it's like, you don't even feel confident enough to even serve God. It's like, you know there's a word inside of you, but then your conscience is smooth. You can't do it. The good news is this, that Jesus said in his word, that come boldly, come boldly. In the time of trouble and help. So I actually have to be in trouble, and I need help when the scripture says come. If your aunties told you that God will not bless you because you sinned, they have robbed you. But the greatest time to run to him is when you feel guilty. But they condition your mind. The enemy has conditioned your mind to believe that the day I feel the worst is the day I should be more far apart from him. But Ronnie, if you are dirty, would you tell the shower that I'm too dirty, I can't enter the shower? You will say that I need to enter so that I become clean. And if you try to clean yourself with a paper napkin, it won't wipe off the dirt. So that's what we're doing. We're using paper napkins to wipe ourselves. But it's not fixing the issue. Jump into the shower of righteousness. Come in. Come. Come and obtain grace. If you're in this room and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior and you've been in sin, look, trust me, you are dead in your sin, so you wouldn't even know how to do it. But this is the time the Holy Spirit is convicting you, is calling you out so that you can become an overcomer. If you're here, every eye closed, every head bowed, and you want to bring Jesus into your life, that Lord, I need your help. I've tried it on my own. I need your help. Just put up your right hand. Put up your right hand. Lift it up high. Lift it up. Lift it up. Lift it up. It's the greatest decision you could ever make. So I, I ask you to make it. Feel strong. Nobody, nobody's looking at you, but just lift up your finger. This is the time that we're in. Now ask. The Bible says even if one comes to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, the heavens rejoice. I am happy that in C3 today, more than one is making the decision. Heaven is throwing a party on your behalf. Heaven is, I'm telling you, Angel Gabriel is on the mix. Everybody's, the, there's a party on your head. So I'm here to tell you, the day you feel the worst is actually your best day. Jesus calls you. Lift up your hand, Elder Graham will pray for you. Lift up your hand if that's you. And then come to us in the welcome center and we want to follow with the other ground. Pray for you, sir. Close this up. And so, Father, we thank you. Thank you that you called us from darkness into light. Wretched as we were, you saved us. 
And so my brothers and sisters whose hands are up now, they are saying, Lord, save me. And so, Father, as their hands are lifted, I pray for each and every one of them. Lord, save them. May they take you in as Lord and Savior. As in the sincereness of their heart, they have admitted that they are sinners. We've all admitted that, Lord, we cannot do this without you. Father God, may you save us. May you save us. May you save us. And Lord, because you are saving us, because you are saving them, no plan of the enemy can pluck them out of your will. And so today, as their hands are lifted, we plant them in the blood of Jesus. And we declare that they are not going back. Though there will be struggles in the journey, there is no point of return. They are not looking back. They will keep pressing on. They will keep pressing on. And we know that indeed, when the day and the time is up and you call us, we will all smile in heaven knowing that we are with you forever. So I bring everyone here, oh God, and I thank you for this message. I thank you for today. I thank you for your word. We bless you for your servant that you have used. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we welcome our sister? Amen. All right, were you blessed? Because I know I was blessed. Amen. You want to tell your neighbor, remember your body count. All right. So we're going to just go straight into giving. Um, we're going to wait for the media team to put up the ways to give. You can give via Cash App, Venmo, PayPal, and I believe Zelle as well. And then while we're giving, we'll also have them play the announcement.
Amen. All right, if today is your first time worshiping with us or fellowshipping with us, we would like for you to raise your hand. Don't be shy, we won't make you stand up. Welcome. If you're sitting nearby, you want to wave to them and say welcome. And our hospitality team will be coming around with connect cards for you to fill out. And then our welcome team is in the back waving. And you want to make sure that you see them and go to the room straight behind so that we can welcome you all. Amen? Amen. Amen. Also, if you gave your life to Christ today, we also ask that you go to that back room as well to meet with the elders after church too. Amen. All right, somebody say capacity. So capacity will be taking place on March 1st. You know, February ends on the 29th, which is a Thursday. So we're just going to meet that following day on March 1st, which is a Friday for capacity. Amen? Amen. And I believe Elder Yao has an announcement. Right. Somebody say evangelism. evangelism. Oh, one more time. Somebody say evangelism. evangelism. All right. So this is what we're doing. We're doing something different, something fresh, something unique, something that's needed in this city. We're going to use uh, Wednesdays, the last Wednesday of every month, the whole church. I'm not talking about just those who go in the, are in the evangelism team. We're talking about the whole church. We want to hang out in D.C. at 5, on like from, anywhere from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m., sharing the gospel and then also singing songs of praise and worship. So our plan is that we're trying to draw people in. By just, you know, singing, dancing, celebrating, just worshiping God. And then we'll also give a word, a word that will, we pray that as it's released, people will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So we want everybody to be a part of this because all of us are soul winners, right? And so the plan, what we're going to do is, uh, the, the first one we're going to do is this February. It's going to be um, Wednesday the 28th from 5 p.m. We're going to be there around, let's say, like 6.30 to 7. And we're going to be at the gallery, I believe. Is it the gallery? The, for Chinatown? What is it? Gallery Place. Gallery Place, Chinatown. So that's, that's, that's where we're going to be at. And um, let me, I have the di directions here. Okay, perfect. Location is Gallery Place, Chinatown. It's in front of the theater next to Clyde's Restaurant. So we wanted to find a place where there's a lot of people so that we'll be able to share the gospel. Look, there's a lot of us, we may be living in Maryland, VA, some in D.C., but our plan is that D.C. must know spiritually that we're here. And they must also know that Christ is in the city. And I don't know who else is doing it, but my, our plan is that we want to be the ones to do, do it and do it loud. So the only way we would do it loud, look, all of us were beautiful. That's one way of showing the expression of Christ. Just even when some, some people be walking, they maybe just want to see, wow, look who these beautiful people are. Then they'll all hear our beautiful voices because all of us sound good, right? All right, so we're all going to sing. And then you don't have to be in the choir. We're all just going to sing. We're going to dance and celebrate. And then we're going to preach the word of God. And then we're going to pray that the Lord of the harvest will send us souls. This is not for them to come to Cap City. We just want to win souls for Jesus. If they come here, praise God. As long as they find a Bible-believing church, that is what we care about. But the Lord said, go ye into the world. And I think all of us need to do this. We, I'm, I'm tired of it being a section of people. I think it's time for us to do it. All of us to do it. Somebody may say, it's Wednesday, Yao, it's a work day. The thing is, D.C. is busy during the weekdays. Around 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. People are getting off of work. So we want to catch the people when, where we can. And it is, it is going to be an inconvenience on us, but trust us. Um, we do this unto the glory of God, and we do this to help others. And we put ourselves last so that Christ is glorified. Amen? So who's coming to the first one, please? Let me see by hands. Okay, okay, I like that. It's, it's fine. I know the Holy Spirit will breathe on you. Uh, it will breathe on you for the week. <laughs> but please come out with us, and let's win some souls. The same salvation you have, somebody else needs it as well. Amen. God bless you. Amen. God bless you. So for those that have a giving ID, please check your emails for the yearly contribution report. It may be in your spam, but everyone that has a giving ID should have also received that email. And I believe those are all the announcements. Oh, small groups week will not be this week, but it will be the following week. Amen. Let us all rise for closing prayer. So I'd like you all to hold hands with your neighbor. 
And before I close this out in prayer, I want us to just think about the message that has come and pray to God and ask him to help us to really just place our bodies on the altar daily, that we will not just make it a thing that we heard the message today and, you know, it went in this ear, out the other, but it will be something that put, something that hits our hearts every single day. So let's just go ahead and pray and ask God to help us to lay our bodies on the altar daily. God, in the name of Jesus, we pray, oh God, and we ask, oh Lord, that you help us, oh God, day in and day out, oh Lord, to place our bodies on the altar as a sacrifice, oh God, holy and pleasing and acceptable unto you. We pray in the name of Jesus, oh Lord, that as your word has come, oh God, may it penetrate, oh Lord, our hearts, oh God. May it not just be something, oh Lord, that we hear, oh God, and discard, but be something, oh God, that we place in our hearts, oh God, that we can walk with them, oh Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for today.